Charles. Welcome to the June 10th, 2021 meeting of the Town of Southampton Planning Board in accordance with the Governor's Executive Order 202.1 and its related extensions and until further notice, all of the board's meetings will be held remotely via video conference. So we ask the public to continually check the town's website for updates and new information. And we have a roll call, please, Glorian. Absolutely. Uh, Chair LaFaro. Present. Chair, Vice Chair Finity. Present. The secretary is here. Board members, board member Zuccarelli. Present. Board member Long. Present. Board member Catalanato. Present. Town Attorney Murray. Good evening. Thank you. Can you please join in for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the Republic, Republic for which, which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. We have two public hearings this evening. We have applicants and members of the public standing in by a Zoom webinar, which is being moderated by CTV. Charles Certain will be muting and holding the speakers in a virtual waiting room until it's their time to give testimony before the board. A reminder that applicants, agents, and members of the public speaking should state their name and address for the record. A further reminder that despite the Zoom environment, all comments should be directed to the board and not to other participants. The link to participate in this meeting via Zoom can be found on the town's website. The meeting is also being live streamed on the town's website on the town clerk's meeting portal. If you're having difficulty accessing the meeting, visit the town clerk's meeting portal and click on the instructions link. Public comments can be made by a Zoom, by email, or by uploading them to the town clerk's portal on the planning board's page. You'll see on that page a button you can click to upload your comments. Please do not use Zoom chat function to register your comments. Any comments made via chat function will not be included nor made part of the record. Instead, you may either speak at the hearing or submit your comments in writing after the hearing. Board members who must recuse themselves from any application will state so on the record and will be removed from the meeting until the end of the hearing. Board members, I mean, unless otherwise stated at the end of each hearing, these applications will remain open for written comments from the applicant and public for 30 days. Those comments can be made by email, by uploading your comments on the town clerk's portal under the planning board's meeting page. Additionally, in accordance with the governor's orders, these hearings will be recorded and transcri transcribed and will be made available to the public. Thank you. So, do we have staff here? I see no staff. <laughs> Uh, I'm texting uh, Claire Shea, Madam Chair. Hopefully you can get her on. Okay. No hands and no staff. No to Jackie, never start the meeting without staff. <laughs> they know they can read a clock as well. <laughs> I know, but I, I remember when I looked around, I didn't see staff. I said, hmm, let's just. Uh... If it's an old analog clock, they may not understand it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true. Oh, um. So we have loaves and fishes first. Pretty unusual. It is unusual. I wonder if they're, you think they could be having internet problems up there? No, because Kathleen is. Staff has usually gone home for the evening session. Claire? Usually she goes home. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Jackie Fenlin's going to um, jump on. She just needs about two minutes. Uh, okay. Claire was supposed to be um, heading home, so hopefully everything's okay. Right, she's probably stuck in traffic. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. It's been really difficult everywhere. How is it west of the canal? Terrible. Yeah. Terrible. 
Yeah. Terrible. And that intersection is a real charm. Nightmare. By the canal. Over the bridge, near the yep. bridge. Yep, that is a charm. Oh, that's going to be a charmer. Were you, on, were you on the board, Robin, when we had the two highwaymen from Suffolk? Yes, well, I was. They absolutely refused to listen to anything. I know. Yeah. We talked about the box, not to have that U-turn. I still, that U-turn has got to stop. Somebody's going to get killed. That U-turn is hard because people are making a U-turn. It's, it's going straight. People are making lefts. It's the not one, a good thing. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Watch. Is the guy coming out of Canoe Place? That's what I'm talking He's about. He's looking to the left for traffic, not ahead. He's not That's looking right. for U turn. I've seen, I don't know what I have seen those in several places. It says U turn has priority over left turn on red. And I don't remember where, but they were stated. And I'd say I was positive New York State. It, it takes a little bit of time to figure that out. Yeah. Say that again, U turn. Yeah, no, it says. U turn priority over left hand, a right hand turn. I think it should just be no right on red. That's all. I yeah. think you should just avoid that area. No right on red. And they, that would solve it. They, they put the, John, they put the box up by uh, the cowfish uh, entrance. And they I saw the guy canoe close road last night. Sure enough, one van was blocking the box. Someone's going to make a left to turn cowfish. Backed up right across Montauk Highway. Light changed. Line of cars, horns, people leaning on the horns. And at least it, no one was getting killed. So, they, so they did stripe the box, Dennis? They, they the did stripe that box, yeah. Uh -huh. And a lot of times it works, but last night coming down to New Place Road, I said, oh, but. <laughs> yeah, not but You still have a problem with that right turn on red when people making U turns. And, and the, it's, it's, we've got to look at that again. It, yeah. Got it. I, I go that all the, all the way. If they do that, I'm going to have to come through Hampton Bays or at least use Old Riverhead Road up to uh, where the railroad bridge is. Yeah. Yeah. Believe it or not, downtown Hampton Bays is kind of functions. You know, they have the turn signal on Ponkwalk, and I found myself going right through downtown. Yeah, we're I, fine there. But how did you come into Hampton, downtown Hampton Bays? Well, you either have to come hmm. in from, you know, the Macy's Shopping Center or over the canal. But mm -hmm. The, the the lights are signalized, uh, coordinated, and um, yeah, it's very well done in him. Yeah, yeah. you have enough lights, to, to, enough opportunities to make safe left hand turns at lights in Hampton Bays. Yeah. Okay, yeah. here we go, Jackie. Thanks for stepping in. Hi, yeah, no problem. Um, I just had a question for Patty. If I didn't see the affidavit um, in the file, do I need to read that into the record, or if anyone has that? Uh, yeah, um, actually, the notices aren't in the file. So Patty was looking, uh, grabbing the paper. Um, okay. So she could read it from there or send me a picture of it. And one of I can read, I'm happy to read it. Okay. Okay. Who else is around, Jackie? Is... Uh, it's just me. And I have the site plan and everything ready to go. Um, okay. I just, I didn't see the affidavit in the file. So I was just trying to look for that. Uh, well, I can tell you that the affidavit, I have a copy of the affidavit of posting and mailing and they okay. are acceptable. Oh, sorry. I think I'm meaning like um, the- Just the, the actual notice that we're waiting yeah. for. We actually need to, we need to read that into the record? The notice. The meeting notice, uh, yeah. we should, yes. All right, let me see. Oh, I found it actually. You did? I did found it. I found it. Yep. You found it. Okay. Yep. I can read it. Yep. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, please take notice that in accordance with the governor's executive order number 202.1, a public hearing will be held by the Southampton Town Planning Board on Thursday, June 10th, 2021 at 6 p.m. video vi via video conferencing to consider the site plan special exception application entitled Loaves and Fishes. The application is to construct a restaurant with four affordable apartments, second story, and a single family residence with cross access to the east on a 1.2 acre parcel situated in the HO zoning district located at 2252 Montauk Highway, Hamlet of Bridgehampton, Suffolk County tax map numbers 900-69-2-17.7. A transcript of said hearing will be provided at a later date and the public will have the opportunity to see and hear the meeting live and provide comments. Um, in, in, let's see here. 
So, and then, sorry, I don't have the part about in the event, you know, by order of the secretary, Gloria and Burke secretary. Sorry, I don't have that part. <laughs> <laughs> so do we know who's representing the application? Is it? Yeah, uh, this is Eric Bregman. Eric. Yeah, so Eric, if you can- are you here? Me. Charles, can you? Coming in. Okay. I'm coming. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Eric. Yes. Can. Can you can Hello there. Uh, <laughs> welcome. Uh, that's, Hi, and that's Sophia in the background. Hello, <laughs> Sophia. <laughs> Um, Eric, if you'd like, oh, sorry. Let me put her outside of the room, for, sorry. <laughs> She's not moving, I won't waste time. <laughs> Eric, um, you need your name for the record, please. Uh, Eric Bregman at Eric Bregman uh, PLLC 10, <clears throat> excuse me, Gingerbread Lane, East Hampton, representing the applicant. Well, give us a, a brief overview of the application. Yeah, sure. Eric, would you like me to share the site plan as you're describing it? Um, sure. Okay. And I have some stuff so I might want to share too, but let's just okay. go. All right, because can everyone see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. good. Okay, this is a uh, north is obviously to the right, um, Butter Lane and Montauk Highway. Montauk Highway is to the south. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, uh, as mentioned, a restaurant, a neighborhood restaurant for senior affordable apartments on the second floor and a single family residence in the rear. Um, <clears throat> there is a rock and sculpture garden between the two buildings. You can see it. I, I don't know how to point from there, but. Can you point that out? Um, Jackie, can you flip it around? Uh, yeah, give me one second. Yep. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, nope. <laughs> oh. Uh, in the middle, I have my cursor on it, but you can right there. That's a, uh, <clears throat> a rock and sculpture garden between the two buildings. There is cross access uh, and parking uh, with the Bridgehampton Inn and Loaves and Fishes to uh, the um, to right the here? west, right to the east, sorry. Um, and the traffic flow for both properties is controlled in that the entrance, uh, it is entrance only from Montauk Highway, no exit. And the exit, that's right, exactly right. And the idea is your, your um, to make a left turn on the highway, you go outside of uh, onto Butter Lane and then down. And this was, uh, Dennis was uh, pushed very hard on this when we did the site plan for the, um, the Bridgehampton Inn to the east um, and it's come to fruition. Uh, the, there's a landscaping plan. Do you have that or do you want me to share and put that up, Jackie? Um, I might have it. Oh, now I'm... Okay, yeah, that's... That's, I wanted to show you that, it was so terrific. All right, so let me um, make it not upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I think it depends on how it scans and then we can never get it to save correctly. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Okay, so you can, that's the Bridge Hampton Inn and the Loaves and Fishes Cook uh, Shop to the right, that is the east on the top and the new um, the uh, restaurant with the apartments above on the left or the west. And the lower picture is looking at the, the um, along Butter Lane. Um, in the landscaping plan, there'll be large trees will, uh, will be uh, protected uh, within the plan. Um, there will be a visual screening will be installed along the traditional yard area by the applicant. And that's um, as agreed with the neighbor to the north, if we can go back to the um, site plan. 
Um, and then we've worked very hard with the neighbor to the north. Um, now we're upside down, I guess. Sorry, yeah. Every time I change it, it changes everything. I'm sorry. But this is the north right here. It's the north. And if you see along that border, uh, if you can get the landscape plan, you will see that there are um, a uh, very dense screening there. Um, and we worked hard with the, uh, the neighbor to the north. We've agreed on a covenant, uh, which uh, requires us to keep that, to install and maintain uh, that uh, screening. Um, and uh, the neighbor to the north has been uh, smart and helpful, and we've reached agreement with them on that. Um, and also they've been helpful and had good input on the lighting plan, uh, designing uh, fixtures, et cetera, so that it's both um, technically and aesthetically uh, works for everybody. Technically in the sense that none of the light spills off the uh, property at all. And also uh, it looks pretty um, and uh, it works well. The design, as you saw from the pictures, Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Are we back? Okay. Yeah, no, I can bring it back. Okay. Uh, the design, as you saw from the, the cover picture, um, <clears throat> it is integrated with the adjacent uh, inn and cook shop, and it gives <laughs> harmonious ensemble uh, to the properties. Uh, no variances required. There were some minor variances, and they were all granted by the zoning board. Can you guys hear me? Yes. So, yeah. Okay, good. Um, the parking is conforming. Um, the uh, there was a negative debt <coughs> the fellows uh, issued as lead agency with the zoning board, um, and the parking is conforming. Uh, Thirty-two spaces are required, and thirty-three are supplied. And also, of course, it works well with the uh, with the inn because at times when the inn is going to be busy, the restaurant would be uh, less busy, so they can share that parking. Um, the uh, sanitary and septic system, the town has consented to uh, <clears throat> a transfer uh, of a certain amount of flows that's required, uh, and the plan is uh, being presented to <coughs> the um, uh, the South County Department of Health Services. And you have seen this, so I think you know it if you have any questions. Um, Jackie, you can you get it off the screen now? Because my screen is black. Oh, so sure. is mine. Yeah, mine, sure. mine. Okay. All right. You know what? I got kicked off my remote desktop. I'm sorry. Okay. So we, we've seen this. We've had this in work sessions, et cetera. Are there any questions for Eric before we go to the public? It's just going to be senior housing, Eric? Yes. Affordable senior housing, yes. Rental. Yes. Thank you. And in con in conformity with the, the town's regulation, <coughs> but also limited to seniors. Thank you. Is there someone who would like to speak to this application that's in the waiting room? See no hands. Nothing? No hands. Okay, and no more questions from the board. So we will um, close with a 30 day written comment period. Could have a motion by Dennis, second by Robin. All in favor? Aye. Opposed abstentions? We have a 30 day written comment period. Eric, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Uh, the Atlantic Golf Club is a continuation, so we don't need to read that into the record at all. Okay. Um, Wayne Bruin is here, but right before Wayne comes on, Wayne, you could come on. We just want to read something into the record. You there, Wayne? He's coming. Okay. Here I am. Hi, Wayne. Welcome. We just want to read um, sure. uh, something into the record. Uh, Kathleen? Yes, Madam Chair, on June 4th, 2021, the Chief Building Inspector did issue an interpretation um, as discussed at the last meeting. Um, I'll read the relevant portion of that interpretation. Staff housing meets the definition of an accessory use 
in that it is a subordinate and incidental use located on the same lot as the main use of a golf course, parentheses 330-5. It has been a customary use in the town of Southampton for some time. Currently, there are several golf courses that provide staff housing. The application to provide staff housing at the Atlantic Golf Club will be considered a customary accessory use to the permitted golf course. And this is part of the file. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay, Wayne. So good evening, board members. Uh, Wayne Bruin, I'll show you more sense of Bruin on behalf of the Atlantic Golf Course. Um, you may recall I've been involved with the Atlantic uh, for several years since uh, 2000. Um, and recently, uh, based on the comments raised at the public hearing, they asked me to get involved in this current application. I did have the opportunity to review the public hearing comments and review the file and the notes. And um, I just want to take the opportunity um, to provide you with a couple of general observations. And, and, and what we would hope is that the public hearing would be closed with your uh, customary uh, period for um, written, written comments so that we could address anything that comes up or any questions the board may have. So um, the reading the letter from the building inspector takes away a little, uh, a lot of what I needed to say, but um, just for the record, um, I, I need to uh, address the, the comments that were raised by the public in the past and just perhaps uh, educate those who may not be fully familiar with the history of the Atlantic Golf Course. Um, the board will recall that the subject property was once a working farm with multiple dwellings and farm buildings, um, including in those multiple dwellings was the use of the buildings for housing for agricultural labor. In the late 1980s and, and, and uh, culminating in July of 1991, the planning board approved the site plan for the Atlantic Golf Course. And those were plans included uh, the conversion of uh, at least two of the dwellings for maintenance um, and staff housing. So early on in, in the <clears throat> application and where the building inspector is saying it's a customary accessory use, it goes back at least to 1991 in the Atlantic Golf Course, if not before that. Um, the reason I say that is uh, many other golf courses have that, including some of the older golf courses, National and Shinnecock, and I'll mention those later. But after the planning board approved the golf course in 1991, in 2000, uh, the planning board approved the conversion of a storage building for additional staff housing. And, and I think there was a recognition at that time, and this is in the record, and it's in your record on many golf courses, is that there was a need to provide uh, you know, workforce housing, if you want to call it, that's the current term, but staff housing or employee, uh, employee housing on the property, particularly with a golf course, which was seasonal and everybody commutes. Um, and these uh, golf courses are all in residential zones. So to more or less... <coughs> Uh, help alleviate the traffic uh, and the commute and, and et cetera, um, many of the golf courses were seeking and obtained approvals, both from the planning board and the building department for staff housing. So in 2000, there was a conversion of um, uh, a storage building to additional staff housing. Then again, in 2004, the planning board approved further expansion of the staff housing. And, and now in total, there's 26 um, <coughs> uh, units or beds for staff housing. However, and, and why do we need this? Well, the Atlantic Golf Course employs well over a hundred uh, uh, seasonal employees. And uh, so you can see we're only accommodating 26 of those at the present time. So there, there has been a need and, and, and it's also an employment issue for our local golf courses because to get qualified people in some of the key spots, the housing uh, incentive and, and the provision for housing becomes important. And it takes, um, you know, of course, the commute and, and, and take, taking people off the road. Um, you know, it's interesting, the comments we receive um, were characterizing the staff housing as a prohibited multifamily dwelling or a motel use. And it seemed like without 
the review of the record on this golf course or others and in, in what was now recognized again by the building inspectors, it's been a, a long standing determination by both this board and the building inspector that staff housing is a customary accessory use. Um, you already um, pointed out, but just for example, National Golf Links had originally when it was first established in, in its clubhouse staff housing and then uh, realized they needed more and a, bu a building was built. And more recently, when the planning board approved uh, a new maintenance facility, they also approved uh, adjacent to that additional staff housing. Um, Shinnecock Hills has staff housing, Southampton Golf Club, I represented them when they obtained. And today I saw on your agenda, you were uh, signing site plans for staff housing at the bridge. So uh, clearly I think this board uh, recognizes that it's been a customary <coughs> accessory use. And here the determination that it was a customary accessory use on this property was made when this board approved it in 1991, let alone the previous approvals. So this is not a new determination that the building inspector is making. He's, he's affirming that which has already been made. Um, changing subjects for a second, there was uh, claims we read um, by an attorney that the planning board uh, staff has not reviewed the application or provided this board with any guidance or a report. And I, I believe the board knows that uh, you know, to the contrary, that the staff and the planning board have had not only the benefit of all the review previously in the many years and different uh, variations more recently, you know, the changes to the uh, driving range and, and that sort, but also you had the benefit of um, the pre-submission report back in November uh, where this board reviewed uh, the application as a pre-submission had a hearing and adopted a report on November 12, 2020. Um, and you provided recommendations and, and, and your insight as to compliance to the code. But more importantly, you also, in uh, this spring, on March 17, 2021, after uh, the, the application was submitted and after review and preparation of the necessary environmental assessment forms by the staff, you adopted a negative declaration under secret. Um, and, and basically saying there's not going to be a significant adverse impact to the environment. And so there has been review uh, despite the uh, allegations to the contrary. So there was also a comment and I just wanna clear the record. There is a proposal that the Atlantic Golf Course has um, more or less is agreeing to which was recommended by the planning board. And that has to do with the extension of the existing trail. So back in 1991, when the planning board approved this, there was a trail easement that was along the entire northerly side of the Atlantic Golf Course. It terminated, however, at the shores of uh, the pond. Um, and so more recently, when the board uh, referred this matter to the um, Trails Advisory Board, and they provided their comments, they requested that we consider granting an extension of that trail so that they could get out to Scuttle Hole Road. And the map you're looking at is actually prepared by the planning uh, or the town. I don't know exactly who, but it's based on the recommendations of the trails advisory report. And the two routes there are all based on, uh, I believe, somebody in the trails uh, advisory board uh, GPSing those. Um, and so to that extent, um, the extension is being requested by the town. The Atlantic Golf Course is, is willing to consider that. And, and as has been indicated in the record, um, and in fact, we're willing to consider it in, in the two alternative locations that were previously submitted by uh, Mr. Panza on behalf of the golf course. Clearly, and this was a recent comment, clearly we cannot grant an easement over an adjoining property. And I don't think it's either the board's intent nor our ability to do so. Um, there were also a number of comments, which I have to just briefly mention as to staff housing and expressing you know, um, particular adverse impacts due to the residency of the staff. And they're not based on what I would characterize as any empirical evidence. Uh, it's more uh, emotional evidence. 
Um, the Atlantic Golf Course has never received a complaint as to any of the activities or impacts that were alleged by the opponents for the existing housing. Nor am I aware of any complaints of any staff housing to any golf club um, that were raised and, and, and they're just out of place. Um, we want to point out, and if the board would like to see, we can provide uh, Atlantic Golf Course has a strict standards and a contract for, for their employee housing. And among the things, for example, there's no cohabitation, visitors must be approved, there's a strict drug and alcohol policy, and all their standards of conduct that relate to their employment also apply to their housing. So to, to su suggest that there is activities and parties and all the other comments, I think they're out of place um, and, and, and really um, shouldn't be considered here. Um, two elements in a let, uh, Tony Panza, just make a couple comments. Uh, with respect to the environmental aspects, we have received a copy of uh, the conservation board reports. Um, we believe we can comply with everything, but there is one recommendation that Mr. Shea and the board conservation board has made. Um, they note that the improvements are approximately 171 feet from the wetlands. And you know that the standard uh, setback is 125 feet. So we're almost 50 feet greater than the minimum setback. And of course, under the wetland law, there's a presumption that if you meet setbacks and provide the necessary buffers, you're protecting the wetlands. So we're exceeding those. Um, so noting that, however, Marty Shea and, and the Conservation Board recommend that we shift the building further north, which would then take it out entirely out of the wetland jurisdiction. Um, we consider doing that. However, in being trying to be mindful to our nearest resident uh, residential property to the north, we've tried to maintain a 150 foot setback from that property line. <coughs> so, uh, you know, basically we're, we're willing to consider it if that's what the board wants. Uh, I think that uh, we're protecting the wetlands as it was recognized, um, we're meeting all the setbacks. Being out of the jurisdiction just means that you wouldn't have any authority to review it from a wetland permit standpoint. Um, there was a comment even made that the board should apply the agricultural housing standards, uh, which don't apply here. But if you did apply, the 150 foot setback would be what, what is required. And so that's actually being maintained here. So uh, I'll let uh, Tony Panza make some comments. We're here to hear uh, any further public comments, but we'd ask the, the, the hearing, it's already been held open for 30 days. We ask that it be closed and, and we have an opportunity to provide a response to any further questions the board has or um, any members of the public might raise. Tony. <coughs> Tony here. Who are we looking for? Tony Panza. Tony Panza. He's coming. <clears throat> Sorry about the sun. Can I? Is the uh, microphone okay? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Um, Jackie, is it possible that I could uh, bring up an image? Absolutely. Tony, please identify yourself for the record. Uh, Tony Panza, <coughs> New York, uh, architect for Atlantic Golf Club. Thank you. And, uh, So uh, just to continue along with some of the um, answering some of the comments and uh, that were received prior, and I think the planning board is aware of this because in our first pre-submission discussion, this was something that it was important to Atlantic in making the submission. We were talking about the view corridor to Shorts Pond. And in our landscape plan and in our location of the building, we wanted to make certain that we brought this project forth that this view corridor would continue. 
So I took this photo today just to make certain that it was up to uh, current. And you can see the planning board notification sign there. Uh, you can see Shorts Pond. Um, there were also some comments that were made um, uh, falsely, I would suggest that uh, Atlantic has been doing clearing along the pond. You'll see that obviously uh, Atlantic has not. Uh, that is you know, in the wetland area, so they don't take down trees and things. But this is the view corridor that we want to uh, continue with. And um, that view corridor, this is where I took the photo from, it's looking straight through here. <coughs> the whole reason why the building is located where it is and the plantings are located where they are so that view corridor can continue. And then the same thing, same location, the plantings that we provided uh, and these plantings here different from the plantings that we previously discussed, which occur further up Scuttle Hole Road, which is essentially a, a blockage of the entire view with green giants. Um, these are more of uh, trees that meet with uh, Marty Shea's um, comments. Uh, some of them can be changed out, but again, that's the view corridor. The, the other suggestion, uh, just to point that one out very quickly, was that somehow uh, Atlantic wasn't a good citizen of the area and that um, Atlantic <coughs> might be clearing along Shores Pond. This is an image from um, 86, showing prior to when the golf course was in place. Uh, and you can <coughs> see all along the shoreline here, uh, the when the farm was in place, it was right up and as well over here. If I can go to uh, a view, which is, uh, here's the, the property line. Um, you can see that the Atlantic does not touch the area around the pond. They're not into clearing any of these area. And in fact, uh, there's greater growth because they, don't, they do not go in and take down these items. Um, and uh, not that, that we think that the public should help us locate the building, but there was a comment, that a public comment that was sent in to the planning board uh, that they please ask that the, uh, that Atlantic Golf Club look at an alternate location to place the building. We're looking up over here uh, and someone went onto the property and took photos of the parking lot. Well, the parking lot is not a viable location because it's in the front yard setback, it's in the side yard setback, um, and that is where the current parking would be. So we would have to then relocate that parking. Um, so we just wanted to touch upon a few of the comments that had received before because we didn't feel that uh, they were uh, they were more in you know inciting than they were based on fact. I can let you take it back, Jackie. Thanks, Tony. Um, if you or Wayne have uh, nothing more to say right now, shall we turn it over to the public? Yes. Okay. <coughs> so who is in the public who'd like to speak first? I don't, we, do you have a list, Jackie? No. Sorry, I don't. Okay. Uh, Brian Matthews. And uh, Christine. Okay, let's take Brian Matthews first. Brian, are you there? I am here, yes. Great, you're on. Okay, great. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I appreciate okay. it. Just identify yourself for us. Yes, uh, Brian Matthews, Matthews, Kirsten Cooley, 241 Panago Road, East Hampton, New York, 11937. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're here on behalf, of, again, uh, for Marianne Gabrielle's the property located immediately to the north of this area of the Atlantic Golf Course property where they're proposing to uh, <coughs> staff housing. Um, and and a, a lot that is, you know, very clearly, I don't think anyone would dispute is the impacted property or, you know, should this application or some permutation of it go forward and be approved. <laughs> um, I do want to address, obviously, the initial kind of change in circumstances from when we were here last, um, the building inspector's determination um, that, to me, I, if I recall, the date was issued this past Friday. 
Um, as far as I know, that's the first I'm hearing of it. I know my client hadn't heard of it and I don't think it had been provided to anybody. So I can't really, it's difficult to comment on a determination um, that's just been issued um, without having seen without without having seen anything that went in to request that determination, who that went in from, um, what correspondence and discussions were had and what the what the determination <coughs> actually says, of course. Um, I think, you know, I think just as a, a cursory matter, we disagree with it. Uh, it's the, the town code very expressly details two two areas of businesses that have that are allowed to have accessory staff housing. Um, and they are restaurants and agricultural use. And whereas, you know, the, the town code does permit customary and accessory structures, they're not, they're not allowed um, if, the, if the customary accessory structure is prohibited by this chapter, which is a multifamily residence, which is where we are here. But nonetheless, you know, we'll, we'll comment further um, on that determination, if and when we actually get, or, or not if and when, but when we actually get a chance to see it um, and see the record that supports it and that surrounds it. Um, but I would just state with respect to Mr. Bruin's request that the public hearing component of it, not just the public comment period be closed. Um, I think that would be in, inappropriate and in, in, uh, premature at this point in time. I think for such a major application like this, people deserve the ability to, to, you know, really review the full record here um, at the time they come to a public hearing. And that's simply just not the case here. And now doesn't mean any, you know, nefarious or anything at all, but it's just because of the recency of it. Um, <clears throat> the fact that this application has been sitting around for, you know, a good, a good part of a year now, at the very least. Um, I think that uh, fairness requires that, you know, the public hearing part be left open. Let's assuming for argument's sake, we where we here right now that the, Staff housing as a concept is permitted here. Um, and I know that Mr. Bruin went on in great detail about educating people about the history of this property, but overlooked in the fact is that they're obviously the fact that a determination was issued, you know, less than a week ago shows that there was no prior ruling on this property. So I'm not really sure um, the statements that there was nothing showing that staff housing for a golf course had been permitted. Um, I think that statement is accurate. Um, also, the, the fact that there was a pre-submission conference and a pre-submission report, I know Mr. Bruin's done probably more of those than anybody. Um, that doesn't really, that didn't serve as a, a, a full review of the merits of this application. It didn't really address the site, the site plan standards, the wetland concerns, um, or the underlying use issue um, that we're getting into now. But let's assume for argument's sake, as we sit here, that staff housing is now a customary and it's customary accessory use to golf courses. <clears throat> there are still significant site plan components um, that this application does not meet that must be considered. And when you look at the other golf courses that were listed there, I believe there's national, there's Shinnecock. Um, maybe I think Sabonic has, has one. Um, the bridge, you look at all of those properties, they're, they're, they're tucked away. Um, they're not right up on the road. And whereas the clubhouse and the golf course here at Atlantic is certainly tucked away in the farm fields to the north um, of, of, or to the west of Scuttle Hole Road, this, this building itself is right in the major thoroughfare, the major view shed. Um, the, the conservation board referral that was just done yesterday um, that I believe was addressed calls this, that this is a, it's a, recognized as a scenic road by the town's water resources and comprehensive plan master plan update. It shows that this is, you know, simply dropping a 16, uh, 16 room apartment, a 16 apartment building um, is out of character here. And so there's, you know, still unaddressed are the traffic concerns that were raised last time unaddressed are the parking concerns were raised last time still substantially unaddressed until just a moment ago. And I still think, inadequately addressed with all due respect are the view shed concerns. How are we addressing the change in the contours of the property that were, that were raised in the conservation board memo? How are we changing? How are we addressing the substantial impact on our client and the surrounding neighborhood and the change in the character of the neighborhood? All of these reasons show that from as we sit here right here and now, even though the use issue may at the time being seemingly be resolved, 
the entitlement to the site plan to have this, this, uh, you can, it, it is in, in essence, a transient motel. They can take issue with that, but that's what it is. And you can call it staff housing. That's who's living there, but it's nonetheless, it's 16 unrelated people living in the same building. Um, that's what that is. So it's transient. It's multifamily. You can call, you can take issue with all those things and dress it up and call it staff housing. And sure, staff housing is a, is an important, is an important issue out here. Town, Southampton, East Hampton, all across the board. No one denies that, but that's not, that doesn't serve as a rationale to have such a substantial project pushed through without really addressing these issues. Um, and so that's where we are right now. We think that there is, you know, we'll, we'll vet the, the use determination and, and see what it says, as I mentioned, and see what went into it when we get the opportunity. Um, but there are significant site plan concerns here and the un, undeniable, undeniable fact that our client's property will be severely and uniquely and forever impacted um, by this 16 room apartment building out of character, dropped in the middle, right next to her house, as far away from all of the Atlantic improvements as they could get it. Um, we'd like the opportunity to address that further. We think that we think that the, the applicant has inadequately addressed those and they should address those questions. They should address the site plan and other questions that are raised in the conservation board refer, referral. Um, and we think we think that the application should be denied, but we certainly think that this is not ready for a close of the public hearing component of this. Um, and I, I know there are also significant uh, wetlands concerns, but I believe um, or my, my colleague Chuck Bowman, who you all know, um, is going to address those probably more eloquently than I can. Um, so that's unless there are questions for me at the moment. Those are our clients' concerns. Those are the issues that we think the board needs to continue to look at and the applicant needs to continue to address. Um, but if there are any questions to me, I, I would like to kind of turn it over to Chuck to address his environmental concerns. Catherine is next. Um, good evening, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the board. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. You see him? Good. Yes. Um, in order to... Uh, Go back to our last hearing. I, I think it's important to note that uh, we were the one who requested or noted that there was no advisory report uh, from Freddie Shea on this property, only a verification of the wetland line. That advisory report I found uh, very interesting and, and I agree with Marty wholeheartedly. Um, Shorts Pond is a critical environmental area. <coughs> Excuse me. Can I ask whoever has an open mic to please silence it? Catherine Pruitt, can you mute yourself? Thank you. Okay, they're muted. Sorry, Charles. No, no it's okay. At least it wasn't my dog barking. You know. Uh, as I was saying, uh, Mr. Shea was only uh, requested at first to verify the wetland boundary, which is certainly correct. Um, in his advisory report, he did de designate and confirm that this is a critical environmental area as a headwater pond to a whole system of ponds heading down to Meacox Bay. I, I know Shorts Pond very well. Um, I have done... <coughs> ecological uh, resource management work there. Um, and uh, wetland regulations uh, not only are about setbacks and buffers in all due respect to Mr. Bruin, but they're also about what you put within the jurisdictional area and areas that may be even out of chapter 325 jurisdiction. You know, this proposed uh, housing development has 16 bedrooms. It has four kitchens. Okay, it has, uh, if my correct, my math is correct, six dryers, six washers. Um, it has accessory parking that is certainly not sufficient. And all of that effluent, uh, even though you have an IA system, is going to impact the groundwater, all the groundwater from this entire area um, through 
drainage easement that is um, located adjacent to this property goes to Shorts Pond. Shorts Pond, as Marty indicated, is a intensely used by uh, waterfowl, uh, shorebirds, and many of the other wildlife, ospreys, bald eagles. I mean, I can go on and on. And it already has an algae problem. And anyone who drives by there during the summertime knows that. So everything should be done to prevent uh, that groundwater, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, loading to exceed existing groundwater quality. I think in our letter previously, uh, we asked that the applicant provide uh, groundwater data that says what the existing groundwater quality is, what the existing Schwartz Pond groundwater quality is, and how they were gonna adversely affect it. Usually the standard is whatever we discharge is not gonna increase that loading. It's pretty simple math but the studies have to be done. You just can't say, hey, you know, we're 170 feet away, everything's good. When you have 16 bedrooms, uh, I don't agree that no one that lives there is ever gonna have any uh, visitors. There won't be any company. Uh, and uh, I, I think that kind of data is really important. Um, again, in due respect to Mr. Brune, he showed a GIS map of the Eastern Trail. Um, we submitted actually aerial overlays based on surveys prepared by Squires and Holden, you know, that show that there is no uh, room. Shorts Ponds Associates owns the entire shoreline, you know, 1,000 feet of shoreline. There is no trail that can be there. And if there is right now, it's trespass. And in the past, there has been a, a history of trespass from the Atlantic Golf Club. Um, I myself had found deer stands there, posted signs by Atlantic Golf Club um, and have uh, actually taken them the surveys, showed them where the property lines are. Uh, so in that case, I, I think that whole uh, trail mitigation is something that uh, should just be discounted completely. Uh, Mr. Brune also talked about uh, the workforce housing, that this is a uh, accessory use that has been established. Uh, as Mr. Matthews had indicated, if you concede that we need housing, which you know, we all live out here, I, I can see that. And, it's, and if you concede that um, a golf course is an agricultural use, uh, which I can understand, uh, you know, certainly uh, it's greenways and grasses and, and open areas. Um, then the code established by the town board should be the one uh, that is looked at. The code for the town board uh, established said that a housing for an agricultural use should have a minimum setback of 150 feet from the front yard. And that should include all accessory structures. All accessory structures should also uh, be 200 feet from any side yard. Mr. Broom failed to mention that, that those setbacks include accessory uses, accessory structures as in parking lots, um, any such uses. Uh, this building is only 80 feet from uh, Scuttle Hole Road. Um, Marty did go into great detail on uh, the value of Shorts Pond uh, and how this could be effective. Um, I believe <coughs> some of his further requests for analysis of view corridors is certainly correct. I believe my uh, request for groundwater data and uh, nitrogen and phosphorus impacts to Shorts Pond is paramount if you were gonna protect Shorts Pond. Um, I certainly was the one who submitted a letter saying there's other alternatives. Um, you know, when I've looked at these other golf courses as Mr. Matthews has indicated, you know, they are tucked away. 
Um, even on Atlantic Golf Course, the you know converting an existing building to staff housing, it's all screened. You know, the parking lot, their own staff parking lot is heavily screened. You know, uh, Mr. Brune indicated that you couldn't put it in the parking lot, or maybe it was Mr. Uh, maybe it was Tony. I, I don't recall uh, because you didn't meet the side yard or front yard requirements. This one doesn't either. You know, so certainly it could go to an, an already screened area and the staff parking could be put up near the maintenance yard. <clears throat> room to do it without impacting Shorts Pond, meeting setbacks and not impacting any of the view corridors and, and neighbors. Um, you know, I'll conclude in indicating that, uh, you know, I agree with Mr. Matthews. This project is far from ready to close a public hearing. You know, we've asked for additional information. And my experience in these types of applications and in any application I've been involved in is that when the public uh, raises legitimate concerns, it's the burden of the applicant to answer them not just with a Zoom meeting and saying, hey, there's not a problem. It's by with hard data and with alternatives that are potentially available. Um, because, uh, you know, otherwise the, the burden to the applicants, Shorts Pond Associates and Mr. Matthews clients is, is tremendous. Um, and um, I, I believe the board's responsibility is to ask to be provided that information if indeed <clears throat> this is to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Charles, next person, is it Catherine Pruitt? Charles? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. I would just, uh, Madam Chairperson and the board, um, I think some emotion has to be brought into these situations. I mean, we have legalities and we understand all of that, but we, we have to bring some emotion in because what the golf course is proposing is somewhat out of the norm for our area. I think we all can agree on that. Um, and I, I did submit a letter with my feelings again, and I, I hope the board had time to review that. Uh, I, I also feel that the, the at, while I'm not telling the Atlantic Golf Course how to run their business, they have 206 acres. And I believe that at, at one point the, the uh, architect had mentioned that they didn't wanna take trees down in the back because of an environmental impact. Um, whereas you're, you're, you're upsetting a, a piece of property that has never had any structure on it, has never had any trees or shrubbery on it. Um, so I, I just feel like we need to explore more where there could be other areas for staff housing instead of front and center on Scuttle Hole Road, which will like uh, Brian Matthews mentioned, change the whole feel of the area. Um, I just feel very strongly about this. I feel like you're trying to take a, a square peg and pound it into a round hole by placing this structure right here. It, it, it will change the ability for, um, I, what about our property values? I'm, I'm certain it will look nice and will be kept neat but nobody's going to want to buy a house across from a multi-occupancy unit. You just, I, I don't care. I, again, I just feel like they're trying, we're trying to pound a square peg into a round hole. Is there no other way that they could put staff housing in the other 200 and odd acres that are back there? Ha has that even been, looked at. Those are my concerns. My concerns are the amount of people coming <clears throat> and going. And it's going to be more than 16. Because now with the change of the world, there's probably going to be more than 16 people in there, even though we say. 
And then I'd just lastly like to say that this is a public hearing and my comments or any person's <clears throat> comments should not be dismissed or pushed aside by the applicant because they feel they're invalid. Um, I think everyone's comments are valid and they should be um, addressed as such. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Charles, next That's person. That's it. No more. Okay, Wayne, can we, uh, you like to have some response, Wayne? Um, briefly, briefly, like I said, uh, we expect the board to close the hearing and provide a written comment period, which is customary given that. And so first and foremost, um, I haven't heard any new comments, no new information, no new comments. And so I would think <coughs> that we needed such, and there's no more people you know, the three speakers who spoke have already provided written comments in various forms, as well as uh, their testimony tonight. So in that respect, I believe the public hearing should be closed and, and provide the written comment period. Um, you know, the interesting thing when I listen to these comments, I'm always trying to determine, you know, what is that the board's uh, jurisdiction and what you're trying to, um, the standards that you have to apply and how they benefit any of the, the neighbors uh, first and foremost. So obviously Mrs. Gabrielle is adjacent to us um, and a residential use. And we've tried to respect that with 150 foot setback for the building, uh, provide screening and the like. Um, as to Mr. Bowman's clients, Short Ponds Associates, they have two vacant lots that are significantly um, closer to the wetlands and have other wetland issues. In fact, you put into the record proposed house plans um, and setbacks and so on. And yet I wonder if the same information that Mr. Bowman is seeking is he's provided that uh, if and when he they decide. I, I would submit that uh, that similar analysis would probably show the two houses would probably have more impact than this. Um, it's interesting the, that uh, Mr. Bowman's comment is that there should be no trail extension. Um, that was the request of the board, as well as uh, the trails advisory board. Um, of course, Atlantic will accommodate the, the planning board either way you go. If you want no trail, we'll, we'll not extend it if, if it's the other way around. Um, just a reminder, the property across the street is all preserved farmland. So we don't expect any houses to be built across the street from us, across Scuttle Hall Road. Um, Mr. Um, Panza already uh, spoke to and the analysis for, we can provide additional information if the board desires as to the view shed. Um, but more importantly, as to alternative locations um, and just <laughs> generally, of course, Atlantic has considered that. Um, the most important part is all the development. And, and what are we talking about? We're talking about accessory housing, staff housing. Um, the, the, for the issues that potentially, allegedly could occur, you want those somewhere that can be managed and controlled. So the, the proximity to the clubhouse area. So the rest of the property west of the clubhouse is all golf course. And, and it's not accessible. You talk about environmental impacts, we'd be building new roads and, and the like. You can't use Noyak Path. That would be you know, very uh, traffic defeating. It would eliminate, you know, create traffic issues just the staff to get to their employment. Um, as, as to this, you know, we can provide the screening if uh, Mr. Bowman believes the screening of the parking lot, the, the current parking lot, we can provide that screening, but we're trying to balance the view shed and the screening issues. So our plan does provide vegetation. If the board wants further screening, we're, we're happy to, to deal with that. Um, as far as other locations, all the other locations on the property are either in the other view shed, on the other part of uh, the pond, or they're within the wetland jurisdiction. So that would eliminate the, the, the possibility for that. And, and as we indicated before, replacing the existing parking lot. Um, we're, we're maintaining an 80 foot setback from Scuttle Hole Road. Um, so it would have to be 80 feet, 80 feet and uh, it, it, we'd still then have to turn around and provide uh, parking area. And where would that go? Um, so 
we, the, the, the Atlantic golf course, along with the board through the pre-application, we considered it. This has been in consideration. I can tell you, um, and everybody remembers Rick Van de Keef, who was one of the planners involved with the Rainer Group, who did a lot of the surveying and engineering for the various plans throughout the years and the original golf course. Um, he, we approached this issue uh, probably 10 years ago in the development of this staff housing 10 years ago and talked to staff about this in a variety of forms. So this has been on the table a long time in consideration and considering the alternatives uh, on the property. But uh, I don't want to belabor this, but I believe that uh, we can address any and all the comments or any of the questions the board has uh, if you have any further questions as well. Thank you. Can I, can I very quickly, uh, Madam Chair? Who is that, Brian? Uh, Brian, Brian Matthews, Matthews, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, very quickly, just two minutes. I, I think it's, it, <coughs> it is a little troubling to, uh, and, and respectfully, I believe, disingenuous for Mr. Bruin to say, you know, kind of be flippantly disregard, uh, it sounds like, to say there's no new comments and no nothing here. I think that's part of our concern, and I think Chuck mentioned that as well. I think this board has a, for this is a substantial project in a, in a scenically, aesthetically, environmentally significant area and it has the board I think has an obligation to demand that the applicant provide a little bit more information here and so part of the reason why he's able to perhaps say I'm not hearing anything new is because except for the building inspectors determination that was read at the beginning that no one's seen or knows anything about there's been no inf no new information put in none of the information that's been requested and identified as being necessary both by my office, by Chuck's office, by the concerned neighbors, and by the Marty Shea. None of that information is here. No additional information on no traffic study, no parking, no view shed analysis, none of the water data to show any impact here. They just haven't provided that information. So it's very easy to say you don't have anything new to say when we're repeating the same concerns and the same requests for information. If and when they provide that additional data and that additional information, I'm sure the board, planning staff, and the concerned neighbors will have plenty more to say. And we think that's why this is, and that's not appropriate to handle for the first time and just a written submission. We think that they should put in additional information to substantiate, to address these concerns. Maybe they are able to address them, but that's the point of this public process, to give the public to address this board properly in this function, whatever the applicant puts in. So they should be able, they should be required to supplement their application to put in this requested information. They should be able to have opportunity to respond and then a follow-up on opportunity to ever to the applicant and the neighbors to address this board in the proper fashion, not in just uh, a, a, a written submission period. We don't think that's appropriate, particularly in this instance where you have such a fundamental shift of a building inspector's determination and no additional data to be put in to ask for the public hearing to be closed. And for that reason among others, we, we ask that it be held open. Thank you. Madam, yeah, Chairman. Madam, Madam Chairman, Chuck Bowman, if I could comment briefly. Please. Um, I, I find it uh, incredible, uh, having worked on many, many applications, that uh, respectfully, Mr. Brune would just say there are no alternatives and that we're supposed to uh, agree that that is factual. There are alternatives. There's 206 acres on that property. There are alternatives, but we haven't been shown any alternatives. Uh, to say that he has met buffers, uh, yes, that is correct. But buffers are one small component of ecological impacts that you have to look at. And we've been told, well, there aren't any. Well, let's see the data that says that there aren't any. Uh, that is what is asked of every applicant and certainly should be asked of Atlantic Golf Course. And again, respectfully, um, you know, I've been at lots of hearings when I've been asked by uh, Mr. Broom uh, to provide that with their consultants. So I, I think it's really important that we get the data out here in regards to the trail uh, and uh, the adjoining Shorts Pond lots, obviously 
when those lots get developed, they're going to be developed with a single family residence that is going to have to meet uh, setbacks and sanitary requirements. They're not going to be developed with a 16 bed uh, workforce housing. So the comparison is a little illogical uh, and I believe out of place in, in this particular instance. Um, I think all the public is asking for here and the adjoining owners is that data is supplied so that you can look at alternatives. You can see what the health of Schwartz Pond will, whether it'll be impacted and how that should best be cited. Schwartz Pond is, is a gem. So regardless of who's doing the developing, you know, it has to be looked at and the data provided regardless of who it is. Now, I know the board is probably aware that the Southampton Press just did an article uh, on this application. The first notice today in the, in the press that allowed the public to know <coughs> that this application is pending. I think it's only fair that uh, other people who may have an interest in it, as in the Conservation and Advisory Councils, some of the local ecological uh, organizations have also have a chance to raise the questions that I have raised and be given the opportunity to the uh, answers. The applicant, it's not my job to do a test well. It's not my job to do water analysis. It's not my job to go to my engineer and, and say, what is the phosphorus and nitrogen loading impacts are going to be? It's not my job to go to a traffic engineer and say, yeah, there's going to be 16 people there that apparently are, have no cars, are going to be riding bicycles and, and walking to the golf course and have no visitors. Uh, you know, Mr. Bruin indicated that the traffic impacts to some other road. What about the traffic impacts here? I mean, it, it's ludicrous to think that uh, those types of uh, assumptions that no one's going to have a car, you know, uh, be adopted by this by this board. So I think we're just asking for data. You know, maybe it's right. Maybe they won't have cars. You know, but maybe it's it's right. Uh, my last comment is that one of the other applicants, Neil Osberg, one of the neighbors, adjoining lot owners, uh, also was sent a letter and asked to participate in this uh, and has, I don't know if he's in there or not, but he, he requested a link, but he did not get it. And, and uh, but he did send a letter and I- He's on. And he's on? How can he didn't raise his hand. <clears throat> okay, well, perhaps he's driving, but his, I wanna make sure his letter was into the record. And, uh, and all I can say is, uh, you know, in a, in a normal application, uh, I think data is required in order to be able to, uh, and alternatives to make a, a logical and informed decision. And I think it's a responsibility of the board to keep it open, ask the applicant to provide the data, and then we can all see what's the best uh, solution uh, to their housing problem. I don't think anyone has a problem with them having needing housing for the golf course. It's just a question of where it's located and how to avoid the impacts uh, to the neighbors in the ponds, period. Thank you. Thank you. Wayne, anything? Well, I'd like to respond, but I don't want this to keep going on and on. And, you know, once I say something and then they're going to. No, you, you'll, you'll be I, it. I mean, we haven't yeah, heard from any of the planning board members. That, so. You know, the testimony tonight, again, is all the same comments. Not, <clears throat> notwithstanding that, everybody's had the opportunity for over 30 days since the last hearing, let alone the time when the notice first went out, to, to review the record and review the records. No, I don't mean just this application, but all the records. So all the records for every golf course, all the prior records, everything I described to you today, I was able to go in in the last two weeks when I was retained two weeks ago and look at the planning board files and records, not only on this golf course, but all the other golf courses in the community. So to say that, uh, you know, to look at all these uh, the records and that additional time is needed or otherwise, uh, you know, it's very disingenuous. 
Uh, I think that the, it's standard for the board under the circumstances that, uh, you know, the testimony is, is all conclusory. I think that Council and Chuck know very well that they can put something in writing. It, it has more substance and it can be addressed in a proper manner. And that's all I'm suggesting is that the board can get those uh, comments in writing. I don't see any further benefit. There is no further pu public comments and there is no you know, empirical evidence being provided in this testimony that we would um, support either you know, uh, of the uh, opponents allegations that are here. I think it needs to be supported in writing. So that, that's the recommendation at this point. And where was the empirical evidence that in the record that it was submitted that would assess the ecological impacts to Shorts Pond? There was nothing. Claire, did, Claire did we have an, an EAF? Yes. A short form EAF, nothing. Yes, um, it was completed. We have your uh, letters. We have your issues. Uh, I can tell you that this planning board reads all of them, that there is discussion that when this applicant uh, application continues to move forward, all of the concerns will be addressed. You know, we're not operating in a vacuum here. Um, we're aware of the issues. We're aware of the situation and they'll be taken into consideration. As Wayne said, there was 30 days. This public hearing will be closed tonight for with another 30 <laughs> days written comment period. That's two months. That is more than um, most applications uh, have. Does anyone on the board, on the planning board, have something to say in support of that or? Dennis? I would, I would support that, but I, I would also want to add, it may be productive to, um, secure the uh, police reports of the staff housing of golf courses for the past 10 years. What, how many incidents were there? How many responses were there? We were, we were being presented with allegations. This is going to be a wild, um, you know, out of control dormitory style uh, um, residence. And I'd like to know, we have real life, real time data um, over the years of approving these staff housing. I'd like to know if, if in fact, these are, are, are troublesome nuisance uses, especially, you know, the police department that is very, very easily accessible. Yeah, that's so, a good point. That's a good point. But I, I would support closing, It'll, yeah. you know, there taking written minutes. comment as well. Anyone else? Okay, thank you all. I actually have a, one question for Mr. Braun. Yeah. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Bruin. Bruin? Okay, thank you. Um, Neil is on. The, the trails, are they all on Atlantic, or the proposed and trails, are they on Atlantic's that, property? Or do they encroach on private identify property? himself, please? That's Craig Cardinalonato. He's a planning board member. Okay, I just yeah. didn't know who was speaking. I couldn't see on the screen. So yeah. that's okay. All right. Okay. So the, the proposed trails, are they on Atlantic's property or do, are they encroaching on private property as We're well? We're not proposing the trail. This is something the board and the trails advisory. So to the extent, now what's interesting is um, Mr. Bowman has raised the question of where the property lines are and maybe the, the surveyors can go out there and plot it. My understanding is that um, their Schwartz Pond is no longer receiving all the runoff because there frankly aren't all these farm fields anymore and they're all grasslands and there's no more runoff as is extensive. Therefore, Shorts Pond, the level of water level in Shorts Pond has receded somewhat. So therefore there is upland that is within uh, adjacent to the pond. It could be town trustee property or it could be Atlantic property to the extent that the trail could go over that. Of course, and I said all along is we cannot provide a trail on someone else's property and sounds like Mr. Bowman's clients would not uh, agree to that. So uh, to the extent that we can provide an easement over our property, we're willing to do that if that's what the board wants us to do. Thanks, Wayne. I see that Neil Osterberg is, is with us to make a public comment. Are you here, Mr. Osterberg? Yes, yes, I'm okay. driving. That's why okay. I'm not on camera. Okay, so please. Um, 
You're thank on. you. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing me. Thank you for recognizing me. So, uh, yeah, so I own 1172 Scuttle Hole Road, which is uh, uh, a couple of, of properties just to the, I guess it is to the east. Um, <clears throat> and um, I submitted a letter. And my concern here is that, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of, of uh, I think that that the, the the integrity of the neighborhood, the the vista, the I don't feel like we've we've gotten answers to the questions and answers to the concerns that have been raised at the last meeting. Um, I did I did not know about this, and I I. After the last month's meeting, I did notice the noted the sign on the property, but you know it's very difficult to read that sign. It's impossible to read that sign unless you're on foot, and uh, so I just think that the that closing the public uh, hearing period is really not appropriate because none of the answers to the questions that were proposed that were posed at the last hearing were really answered. And the other thing is that, you know, as I said in my letter, um, I mean, certainly what happens about traffic? Cars are going to have necessarily <clears throat> going to be pulling, pulling it out of there. It's right on the turn. There's issues with that much parking lot and that much of a structure right in that narrow piece of land. When you look at some of the drawings that were submitted by the golf course, you don't, it wasn't obvious to me where the actual tree line was as it exists right now. And so I think there's a lot of, a lot of issues here. And also, as was stated, the golf course has quite a big property and I don't feel that it is a necessary hardship to them, especially if they really care about the area to, to look at alternative, alternate locations or to expand their existing housing that they have already that's not right on the road. So, I mean, I just think that it's, it's, it's kind of like a landlocked spot. So the only way in or out is gonna be from the road. No one's gonna be walking through, you know, the, the, the wooded area along the, 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 you know, to make a trail to go through someone else's you know, the, the hell property, there's no way to get through that way without going on private property. So I know some of these points have been stated by others, but I really think that it is important that this application be held open so that other people can, um, and, and it, what helps is that, you know, if we don't get any answers to any of these questions, substantive answers or responses, then, uh, you know, it's if, if, if everything's stonewalled, then, you know, it doesn't give the, the public. Uh, we're, we're, we're losing, we're losing your connection. Mr. So I just don't think that it's appropriate to uh, just say that because 30 days have passed that and no. Okay, so I'll wrap it up. I'm just thinking that um, I think that that the 30 day period without any what was raised at the last hearing uh, means that we should just close. It. So, uh, uh, Rick, okay, thank you. The records are totally open uh, to you. you. Know, I'm not, I'm in uh, all the records and the files are totally open to you site plans, aerials, <coughs> plantings, all of that information yeah. is public. Yeah, record. and yeah, and the site plans show that it's obvious that the only way in or out that that doesn't go on someone else's property would be from the road. And there's no information about the impact that that would have, how the driveway, you know, how, and well, M M Mr. Penn, he did address you have that. a parking lot. Right on we're we're losing you, Mr. Osterberg, but Mr. Panza did address. Well, I've stated I've stated what I think. I think that okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Jackie. Yes, Jane. Jane Hill. 
And I want to be very brief. Um, all I want to say is I respect everything everybody here has to say. I understand everybody has a different point of view. But what I really think is I'm going to go back to is the value of these public hearings is the value of the public being aware of what's going on in our community. The article appeared today about this Atlantic Golf Club application in the Southampton Press. I was told it was the most read article on 27 East. I didn't know about this project until I spoke to Marianne Gabrielli, the neighbor, and I own the property over there. I had no idea about this project. So I think what's important is, is that the public now knows, and now let's give them an opportunity, another 30 day extension to have their response to it. Whatever that response is, I'm sure there'll be people who will support it. I'm sure there'll be people that will oppose it, but let's give people that opportunity. And secondly, going back to what all the um, other experts have said is, really Wayne and representing the Atlantic, they really have to come forward and answer some of these questions for us. So we can understand traffic impacts, environmental impacts. All we're asking for is a little more information. And I really don't, I, I know everyone loves to close these public hearings. <clears throat> but in this particular instance, I really believe the public has really been in the dark on this particular application. Why, I don't know. But what I do know is the fact that when it did appear in the paper, it was the most read article. And that tells me something. Well, and I, Jane, Jane, in all due respect, I can tell you that there are postings, there's public notice. We are not responsible if people don't read the information. There is a lot of information out there. And um, well, I what say I can say is that we've extended this application once for a month. There's going to be another month's extension. The we will ask the applicant these hard questions. I mean, that's our job as a planning board. We will get the answers from Wayne and from Tony and but, from the environmental but, review. But Jackie, with all due respect, then how do we, the public, get an opportunity to really respond to that? He, I felt that this meeting today, I would have expected that the applicant would have come forward with answers to some of the questions that were brought up in the previous hearing. I don't think that's unreasonable to expect. Well, you know, they know what the concerns were. Why didn't they come forward today? Well, and they did. Did. All right, look, please address your comments to the board. Okay, well, I, I, all right, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Jane. Your comments are, are well taken. Um, the, sorry, the board, please. could I, I just have a very quick question. What is the downside to leaving this hearing open for another 30 days? What's the, down, the downside is that the application doesn't move along. It impedes us from getting the information to process the application. So, but if they had the way to, to, to bring well, information and they didn't from the last. Dennis, can you? Uh, well, if I. You can't really. You know, there's a fairness policy too. I mean, it's very unusual. Some of the largest applications we've had have. Um, have been held over no more than 60 days. I mean, we're talking about major subdivision with scores of lots, um, type one actions. This is an important application. It's a very public application, but this is that we're now into the second hearing. Um, and now we're, we're about to enter a, a written comment period as well. I don't think there's any comments or information that we're precluding by closing the public portion of this hearing. Um, and the applicants could easily argue at a, a future date that this that this board is taking actions to somehow forestall or hamper or put roadblocks because it, it's it's unusual. It would be out of the box. Um, can we can I just, part um, participation. We, can we I just have... address one question, Madam Chairman? I have just one question just to follow up. This is Brian Matthews. I promise I'll be 30 seconds. I'm going to time you. <laughs> okay. Come on. Um, really? It's usually all I get in my own house too. So I guess that was that goes back to our point of, um, and your your comment. You know, we're going to ask the applicant these questions. We're going to get the the information from the applicant, um, and I think that's all well and good. But I, I guess that's our underlying question. When is the 
like if the board's going to ask the applicant, just, just say a view shed study or a traffic study, just to pick two, two, two topics that we talked about. If the board's going to say, ask for that information, well, when is that going to be done in the 30 days? And then how do we get a chance to address it to the board and to properly respond? I guess that's, that's the, that's kind of the question where we're saying, you know, okay. the, well, if you, the board's, you've handled a lot of applications clearly, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, yeah, certainly you follow the application as the process goes along in the very next hearing that we will have with the applicant, whenever it's on the agenda, look to see when it's on the agenda and follow it from there. We will ask the questions. But if we're saying it's going to be closed, we, it's not going to be back on. Not for the public, for the planning board. The planning board needs to do its work. Understood. Okay, I understand. I just wanted to clarify. That's, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate all of your comments because you can flag stuff, you know, that might not have been presented. That's sure. the value of a public hearing. And now we have to do our work. Okay, Madam Thank Chair, you. if I may, to be distinguished yeah. from, say, the zoning board where everything happens at a public hearing and right. everything happens with public participation, Mr. Matthews, I think you recognize the planning board doesn't necessarily operate that way. This is an Understood. opportunity for them to gather information from the public and then to address those concerns, as the chairwoman noted, is their job moving forward. Understood. I appreciate that. Thank you. Good. And we will analyze and get details and work with Wayne and Tony and, and move forward. So, um, and thank you all for participating. Thank you for your time. So uh, I'll entertain a motion for a written 30 day comment period by Dennis, second by Glorian, all in favor, Aye. opposed abstention, six in favor. So get more of your comments in, more of your questions. We read everything and everything goes into the record. So- Thank you board uh, members. Thank you. So um, I will entertain uh, motion a motion to adjourn by Dennis, second by Zuccarelli, all in favor. Aye. Opposed, abstentions, we are adjourned, thanks. Bye guys, stay are safe. Are you okay? Bye. Stay safe. Okay. <laughs> Technical difficulties. I was worried about you. <laughs> You're okay, good. Good, thank you. Have a good one.